Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn to the book of John. We're going to read John chapter 12, verses 44 through 50. The title of this morning's message is, Whoever Will Believe. Let's read. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will not judge him, will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the, the Father who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me, so is the reading of God's word. The last couple of weeks, we've been going through the Gospel of John, a certain portion, the last week of Jesus' time on earth, and what he said during those few days. The last couple of weeks, we have looked at the Gospel actually in terms that are not often heard coming from Baptist pulpits. And the reason, I believe, is because of job security. A lot of preachers don't want the heat that comes from preaching some of the passages that we have looked at recently. In particular, John 12, 36 through 43, two weeks ago. And then the second part of that message last Sunday was Romans 1, 18 through 32. What we're going to do today is to examine belief versus unbelief. Light versus darkness, judgment versus forgiveness, and condemnation versus salvation. And we're going to be going toward what believing unto salvation means. That little word believe right there is what we're going to be focusing on to try and embrace. Now in John 12, 24, Jesus said, whoever believes in me. Now we've gone over this enough time. That I don't have to ask you again, but whoever means whoever. So when a person, whoever believes, is the context of salvation. But what does it mean to believe? There are many ways to understand that little word, believe. Some are easy and some are not. For instance, I believe I'll go to the store. What does that mean? I may. I may not. I believe it's going to rain today. It means it might or it might not. I can't believe that happened, which is in context an evaluation of surprise. But I want to suggest to you that in Scripture, we have to be careful how we apply and understand the word believe. In fact, what we are talking about from John chapter 2 and verse 19, you don't have to turn there, is written, do you believe there is one God? You do well. The demons believe and tremble. When I was reading that, I thought to myself, what do demons believe? Listen to this. Demons believe that Jesus Christ is eternal. They believe that he is one of the Trinity, that he is creator, that he was born of a virgin, never sinned, died on the cross, was resurrected, ascended to heaven, and will one day return. They believe every single one of those facts about Jesus. But believing facts about Jesus does not save according to James. I've talked with people who have agreed, literally have agreed with everything about Jesus. 
And yet they would confess that they were not Christians and did not want to be Christians or saved. Some of them even with tears coming down their cheeks. Right now, if you've been listening, you might be a little bit uncomfortable. Because if we start talking about believing too much, especially in relation to the demons and the things that we say are required to be saved, all of a sudden, if we think too much, we start saying, well, what about my believing? Is my believing genuine or am I like Judas? Believe me, Ju believe me. Judas believed everything about, G about Jesus. He saw it. He was there. There was no doubt in his mind about all those things. And yet Judas' belief did not save him. Neither did it save those that I have talked to or even the demons themselves. Then, I'm sure you remember the passage in Mark chapter 7 where God, he said, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons and do many wonderful works in your name? And Jesus looks at him and says, depart from me, I never knew you. So if you're like me, I read those kind of things and I start thinking through those things and all of a sudden I become a lot like Thomas. What was Thomas's nickname? Yeah. Doubting Thomas. And I, what I want to do is to take that issue and I, that, that possibility of doubting and I want to try to erase it as much as I can, not from Ron, but from Scripture. Turn to Romans chapter 8 if you would. Because what I want to do is get us out of a hole that I've dug and pushed us into for a little bit. Okay? I want us to talk about believing unto salvation. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, these words. And he's talking to... By the way, you do know every book in the New Testament was written to believers. It was not written to unbelievers. They were all written to believers. So he is writing to believers. Now notice closely what he says, or what he writes. He says, for you did not receive, and we're going to come back and look at that word briefly, <clears throat> the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you received the spirit of adoption. That's another important word. The spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba. Father, now verse 16, this one's big, underline it if you haven't already. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now I want you to go back up into this verse and I want you to see here that it, the word received is used two times, one in the negative term and one in the positive and he says, you have received the spirit of adoption, which means that it is something that is given to us. It is not something that we earn. It's not something that we uh, go after. It's not something that is put upon us because of anything other than the desire and the will of God. Okay, so he says here, you have received the spirit of what? Adoption. Help me because I hope I'm not wrong here. But have y'all ever heard of a child adopting parents? Or do we hear parents adopting children? We do not adopt God. God, by his will, adopts us. Whenever a parent adopts a child in this world, it is by the will of the parents that that child is adopted into the family. Likewise, as children of God, we are adopted because He adopted us, not that we adopted Him. Now, I want you to look at verse 16 very close. It says, the Spirit Himself. Now, why would He emphasize that? It's because the Spirit is part of the Trinity. This is not something that happens from a distance. The concept and the idea here is that the Spirit himself does what? Bears witness with our spirit. Now, that, that is a huge concept. 
The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, at this point, I just want to tell you how important something is. We do not need to let our hearts or our mind overrule the truth of God's word. Okay? When we start questioning, when we start doubting, when we start wondering, if we start trying to figure things, well, do I really believe or do I have false belief and faith and all that? We don't need to trust what we think, not even what others think, but we need to be informed by the Word of God. And why is that? Because the Word of God is truth. It's eternal truth that cannot be set aside by anything, anytime, anyone. So his word is our truth. And so God's truth is to inform our heart. Now, what happens is upon salvation, every believer is given the Holy Spirit. It is not a second blessing. It is not something that we have to seek after to get. It is a gift from God so that the Holy Spirit is in us and he never leaves. Now, here's what's interesting about the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. The Spirit in us talks to our spirit from God's truth. There should have been an amen there. God's Spirit Himself talks with our spirit about God's truth. Now, the, uh, the Holy Spirit is actually arguing against our doubting heart. So how do we, how do we engage the Spirit? It's not by sitting there and, and, and meditating up into the clouds. It is by taking the Word of God. It is by reading the Word of God. And it is by believing the Word of God in spite of what we think. So what I'm doing here when I'm doubting is I go to the Word. Listen, don't, don't call me if you're doubting. Well, call me and I'll point you to the Word. That's all I'm going to do. But you go to the Word because that's what the Spirit uses to talk to our spirit to tell us we are the children of God. If you want to know God and know Him better, it'll come through Scripture, not philosophy or any other way. We can know the Bible without knowing God but we cannot know God without knowing the Bible. You should have written that quote down. We can know the Bible without knowing God, but we cannot know God without knowing the Bible. That's why the Bible is so important. Now, if we want peace and assurance, we go to the Scripture. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. That's way over towards the back. We're staying with the same author for just a moment or two because John is the one who recorded his gospel. And we're going to look at one of his epistles, which is 1 John chapter 2. And I want us to, to see something here that is absolutely phenomenal to affirm a genuine belief unto salvation. Okay? Chapter 2, verse 1 of 1 John. Here's what is written under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. I am writing these things, in other words, the whole book. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, and here's where we slow down, here's where we start underlining. We have a what? Advocate. Glad you saw that. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What is an advocate? An advocate, and, and this is a legal term, and, uh, and, and to understand what is taking place. By the way, where is Jesus right now? He's seated at the right hand of God. Let's not forget that. And, and our, our salvation is not, <clears throat> is not based on emotion. It's based on law. Because what happens when we sin 
It's not that Jesus leans over to God and say, God, Father, you know, I know Ron has done this a couple of 50 times before and he did it again, but if you don't mind, just, just for me, just for me this time, would you forgive him one more time? That's not what happens. What happens is, is Jesus stands and talks with God as an advocate on our behalf. And what Jesus does is he comes with a legal argument. He comes and he says, Father, this is what Ron has done. And according to the law, double jeopardy doesn't happen. I have already paid the penalty for his sin. And it would not be just or right for him to be punished again for what I pay for. And so that's why we are forgiven of how many of our sin? That means past, present, future. And so Jesus goes to God the Father himself, and what he says is, I am, in, you know, and here's the thing about it. I've never been, I've never been sued or taken to court, <laughs> Okay. But when that happens, what you want to do is get the best lawyer you can, right? And you want a lawyer that will speak on your behalf. And so what happens is the court looks at you through that advocate. If he knows what he's doing, if he's savvy, if he's up with the law and the rules and argues well, guess what? You look good. But if you have one that doesn't have a clue what's going on, you look bad. Jesus is the perfect advocate. And so as a result of the advocate, what we have is Jesus Christ the righteous arguing to God on our behalf. So whenever the adversary, he loves to remind us of our failures. So whenever the adversary, either him or even our own heart, starts condemning us, Jesus argues on our behalf. So what does he say? It's already what I've told you. Father, on the cross, I took their punishment. I paid their penalty. I took what they deserve. It would not be legal, right, or just to punish them again. Therefore, they are forgiven according to your law. See, that's the way, that's the way our sin is dealt with. Now, not only does the advocate argue before God on our behalf, but think about this. The advocate also argues with our own spirit. Have you ever have you ever had somebody that says that they talk to themselves? That they they think a lot, they roll things over on the, in their mind. You know, I, I don't worry about people that talk to themselves. It's just when they ask themselves what they just said because they missed it. I got a problem with that one. Okay, that that that's a problem. But he also talks with us. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. And so the Holy Spirit takes our life and he takes God's truth and he says, now look at this. Now look, I know what you feel, but look at this. This is truth. This is what the eternal God has said. This is what Jesus Christ did on your behalf. Now, if you will understand what I'm telling you, if you will Believe it unto salvation. All of a sudden, all the guilt just melts away. And every time it comes back, you just start right back with that same thing. Because you see, truth trumps feeling. And the scripture is our truth. It's not what we think. It's not what we feel. I'm going to tell you something. I don't trust my feelings. I just flat out don't. If I, if I was to live according to my feelings, I would be in... I'd be in I'd be locked up. I'd be in a padded room. So scriptures are truth. It's not what we think or feel. And I know you've heard this before, but I'm just going to remind you. Whenever Satan starts reminding you of your past, you remind him of his future. And do it out loud. Because he can't read your mind. Pray out loud. Are you still in 1 John? Go to chapter 3. Now, I've read you one of these verses before, and I've told you that one of these verses is my car tag, but I've never read you the verse before it. 
And today, I would like to suggest you need to read and hear uh, the verse before the verse that I, Ron, just read, just read the passage. First John chapter three, verse 19. Now, let, let me stop real quick. Look back up here. If you ever doubt salvation, read first John. The whole book is about affirming salvation. He says over and writes over and over again, by this we know, by this we know, by this we know we are saved. So I'm, I'm backing up one verse to show you this. Verse 19 of chapter 3. By this we shall know that we are of the truth. And look what the second part is. Look what, what's the second part? And reassure our heart. And that's what we need, isn't it? That's what we need. And reassure our hearts before God. In other words, in that relationship with Him. For, whoever, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. That's why we don't trust our heart. We trust God and His truth. Believing to salvation. Now, now get the, I just got this this morning. I, I was going back over the message. I had to re, redo it a little bit. Believing in salvation not only results in the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. Not only is Jesus himself our advocate, but the Father himself reminds us he is greater than the emotions of our heart. So what I understood this morning, and I was just like, praise God, I can't wait to get there and tell somebody, is that the whole Trinity is involved in believing unto salvation. I don't know about y'all, but that's, that's pretty powerful. God doesn't just do it. It's not just Jesus. It's not just the Holy Spirit. It's all three of them. You know, one of the things that I try to do when I'm making a decision is talk to people that are wiser and smarter than I am. And usually, I, try, I and I don't have a problem finding them, but I've got certain ones I go to and I ask about, well, guess what? When we have a spiritual problem, who should we go to? The Trinity. Because right here, they give us affirmation. Now, it's at this point that I want to confirm for every believer a little bit more. And, and just let me read a very famous passage. You don't have to turn there. Tell you what, since you're in 1 John, go to 2 Peter. I'll get there in a minute. Just, just get there and wait on it, okay? But when it comes to salvation, there are, are, are tangible ways that you can identify belief unto salvation by comparing yourself to the scripture. Because what I want to show you next is what God does through the Holy Spirit in every believer. You hear that? These things will take place. And it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you, you get saved and you become Billy Graham. That's not what it means. It means that over... Let me read it. Galatians 5.22. That's where I'm going. It's about the fruit, singular. You know that. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When a person is saved, God starts with a basket of those things into our life. And over time, as he conforms us to the image of his son, we grow in all those things. It's not how many times you go to church, how much money you give, how many people you lead to Christ. It's, it's not how many you baptize. Those, those, those are, it's not what God means when he talks about fruit. When he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, that's what it means. And every person who is a genuine believer will be granted by God the fruit of the Spirit. They will have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control because it's planted in the heart. You're in 2 Peter. You're in chapter 1. I've got to go to verse 3 again. His divine power. Who does that refer to? God the Father. His divine power has granted to us. What does that mean? It's something that He gives us. Okay? It's not something we earn. It's not something that we come up with. 
It's granted to us. Keep reading. It's granted to us how many? All things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. So if we need something about how to live our life, guess what? God's already provided it. If, he, if we need something to help us be more like Jesus, guess what? He's already provided it. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Who is that? Jesus. Holy Spirit. Take your pick. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Where do we get our strength from? The scripture. He, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God the Father, the Trinity, point us to the word. Why? Because that's where we receive and embrace what we need to live life and to be more like Christ. So that through them, and this is the verse I told you, I, the, every time I read this part of this passage, it absolutely floors me and amazes me what Peter is writing. Because look at this. So that through them, the scripture, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Son, you become partakers of the divine nature. That means God is in us. We are not God. But God himself is in us. There is a way by which the spirit of God, we have part of the divine nature in us. Thus the Holy Spirit, thus Christ himself. And then look at verse 5. For this reason. In other words, go back to chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Read uh, verse 3 and 4. And he says, for this reason, make every effort. Now that means that we have a responsibility to our, our self. We have a responsibility ourselves to grow in righteousness. We can't do it by ourselves because it comes from God. But there is a, a cooperation is the best way I can term it that God says I'm going to conform you to the image of my son. That's Romans 8 29. And he said here are the things that, this, that are going to happen. And he says now pursue them. Be forgiving, be more loving, be more patient, be more kind by a conscious act of your will. And guess what, Ron? I know you can't do that. So I'm going to put my spirit in you and he's going to help you get it. Now look at verse 8. For if, ah, that's a big word. For if these qualities are yours, and what does he write next? and are increasing. That's why I say that if you want to have a test for the proof of salvation or believing unto salvation, you can look back over the course of your life and you are increasing in love and joy and peace and forgiveness and graciousness and, and all those things. You are becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus. If you're not, if a person is the same way today that they were 10 years ago when they prayed to receive Jesus and got wet in the baptistry, I would venture to say that they are not saved. Is it because of what they are not doing? Well, yeah. And more importantly, it's important that the Spirit is not in them, bringing these things about. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord. Now, here are some quick points. You don't have to write these down. It's all about God's power, not ours. When it comes to believing unto salvation. It's all about God's power, not ours. He grants what we need to live godly lives through the scripture. Through his promises, we partake of the divine nature, which is Christ in us. And so we seek to grow with Christ. That's verse 5 of what we just read. And here's the thing about it. Every believer, okay, every person who has believed unto, unto salvation passes all those tests. Look, I don't, I don't make up the test. God does. And you know what's so cool? Is he, it's almost like God says, I'm going to give you all the answers. Here's the test, but here are the answers. 
How many would you, would, how many of you would have loved that when you were in high school? No, I didn't. I didn't have that. God says, "Here's the test. Here are the answers. No, by the way, I'm with you. I'm not just with you. I'm helping you. I'm whispering in your ear. I'm talking to your spirit. I'm talking to God Himself." See, that's what believing looks like. That's what it sounds like. That's how it takes place. And so the result is an ever-increasing conformity to the image of Christ. And all these things we've talked about this morning is what believing unto salvation looks like and how it happens. You may not even be aware sometimes of what God is doing, but trust me, if you have believed in, unto salvation, He's at work in you. And part of it is putting you in places you don't like. And part of it is blessing you when you don't expect it. Preachers need to talk about that more often, don't they? A blessing when you don't expect it. What's wrong with y'all? I gotta get y'all in minutes. So give me some give me some feedback, you know? Help me out. Back to John 14, 44. Let me read. You, you stay where you are. You stay where you are. Let me just read this. In John 14, 44, Jesus says, Whoever believes in me, see now we've defined believing unto salvation. Whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Yep, see, he's pointing to the Trinity, pointing to God the Father. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. He says in verse 46, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Who is salvation for? Everybody. There's nobody that is left out of the call to be saved. And everyone Everyone who responds to the call is going to believe unto salvation, and that's what it looks like in our daily living. In Philippians chapter 1, in verse 6 and 2, 13, I've, I've talked about it so many times, y'all ought to have them memorized. I ought to be able to call on one of y'all and y'all say it. Anybody want? No? Okay. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 1, 6. 2, 13, it is God who is at work in you to will and accomplish his good pleasure. What is God's good pleasure? Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's why I say, brothers and sisters, the only reason that you should doubt as a believer in Christ is because you haven't been reading the scripture, you haven't been talking with Jesus, and you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. So that's my encouragement. It's when you struggle, and you will, and you will, go back to that. And I hope you've written down the scriptures. If not, go, go to YouTube this afternoon, evening, tomorrow. And, 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 and look at these things so that you can know that you have believed into salvation. If you're here this morning and you aren't sure, let's talk. I'm available except when I'm asleep. And I'm just telling you now, if you call me when I am asleep, there's a real good chance I'm not going to hear it. But anytime you want or need to talk about the faith, love to talk with you. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the affirmation of salvation. Thank you that when we talk about believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is our salvation. That is something that you do not leave to chance. And so I thank you today for those whom you hopefully and I'm sure have affirmed. And that if any hear this, and doubt, may you bring them to a full understanding of believing unto salvation. We love you because you first loved us. In Christ's name, amen. What number, Joel? 943. 943. Let's all stand together.